So I think we'll make a start. Um, welcome to this uh, webinar. Uh, my name is Sarab Jyot Singh. I am the Director of Computer Science at BML Bunjal University. And today I am going to talk to you about decoding the future, artificial intelligence and machine learning. One of the things that at, we focus on in BML Majal University is the fact that we want our students to have an experiential learning. Um, what that means is uh, we want to give you an opportunity to um, not only understand the theory behind computer science, and in particular, my area is artificial intelligence and machine learning, but also to get your hands dirty with these technologies and to be enabled to be ready for actually doing jobs in this area when you graduate. So um, as uh, the title slide says that in addition to being an academic all my life, I also have a uh, business uh, called Tatras Data based out of Delhi that provides artificial intelligence and machine learning as a service. We build technologies for startups that are based in the US. And we also have a foundation by the name of Sabud Foundation that provides opportunities for engineering students from across the country to engage with us and work on social good projects. And so what I'm gonna to do today is to give you a little bit of an insight about why artificial intelligence is a big hype today, why there, it is considered to be one of the most exciting jobs that you could have, and where are we going with this technology? How is it impacting our lives? And I hope that you're gonna enjoy what you hear here and uh, look forward to getting questions from you. So just a little bit of background to me, why am I, entitled to talk about artificial intelligence and who am I? Uh, well, I did my bachelor's in, in mathematics from Delhi University, went away to the United Kingdom, spent 22 years there uh, before moving back to India, uh, moved into the engineering discipline in uh, my master's and did my PhD in machine learning, um, uh, completing it and graduated with my PhD in 2000. I have uh, spent a number of years in teaching uh, and doing research, um, having chaired some of the key conferences in the world. Um, and 
I'm now uh, an adjunct faculty at Aisa Mohali, uh, but I'm, I'm engaged on a full-time basis here at Munjal University and have uh, published extensively in the area that I'm going to be talking about. But at the same time, I was always interested in how does the research that we do as academics impact the real world? And so even back in the 19... 90s and yes artificial intelligence has been around since then and in fact it has been around even longer than then um, i have been involved in applying artificial intelligence to the real world and so uh, early in my career i was involved with the northern ireland knowledge engineering laboratory where we were predicting landslides in hong kong uh, doing predictive maintenance and manufacturing uh, for seagate which is uh, you know, a large uh, manufacturer of storage devices and looking at how artificial intelligence could be used by businesses uh, to uh, retain the knowledge that typically retires with the people that actually built the planes. Uh, so this was a, 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 an aircraft manufacturer called Shorts Brothers based out of Northern Ireland, um, whose planes, uh, you know, are flying in um, you know, Africa, for example, now that may have been built 50 years ago. At the same time, uh, you know, Tatras and Sabud are not my first ventures. So while I was in the United Kingdom, I also set up Lumio, um, which is a, a startup at the time that I was doing my PhD. And we sold technology, um, you know, through uh, large corporates like SPSS, which is one of the largest statistical uh, software manufacturers and is now part of IBM and won uh, a number of awards, including what is considered to be the IT Oscars for Europe. Now, that's just a little bit about me. Uh, what's more important is why am I here and why am I talking to you about what I am discussing here, which is AI. And if we look at the world that we live in today, um, we are seeing an exponential growth in technology. Every day there is a new technology that's coming up, uh, be it artificial intelligence related, be it Internet of Things, robotics, blockchain, quantum computing. You, can, you are literally living through an exponential growth in technology. And you're very lucky as a generation to be in this position that you are now spoiled for choice as to what technology pathway you follow. But at the same time, what we have realized as people who are charged with training you all is that the kind of bookish knowledge that was being given in university degrees is not enough anymore. You are continuously going to have to learn and grow as the jobs that you do become redundant to our world. And you're going to have to continue to develop your skills, continue to reinvent yourself uh, throughout your life. So the university has a responsibility to teach you, not just technology, but to teach you how to learn independently and how to apply the technologies that you have in the real world, because that's going to be a differentiator for you. And so if we look at the skills that are now being developed by um, you know, the, the most um, sought after uh, uh, boards in even schools is where students need to learn how to take risk, not risk that will hurt them, but well-calculated risk, how to be knowledgeable, but how to reflect on that knowledge and inquire through the tools that we have, right? When I was growing up, we did not have things like Google or the internet, in fact, uh, that were able to provide us with any information by searching on it. But just having information is not enough. How do we inquire using the knowledge that we have um, gleaned over these years and reflect on what we see on Google to come up with solutions that are going to be for not just us, but for the general good of society. And so with these principles in mind, 
what we have done in the computer science department here in the School of Engineering and Technology within DML Mijal University is to put together a curriculum where from day one, when you enter in year one of your degree, you are being helped to build solutions. So one of the unique parts of our curriculum is uh, what we call the joy of engineering, where you're being exposed in year one to interesting technologies that are being developed and you're being helped to create an actual product of your own in very first year. We recognize that one of the things that's happening with all of these emerging technologies is the fact that data is being generated at volumes that haven't been generated before. So in the year one itself, you're being introduced to how to deal with the data, how to visualize data, how to understand data, how to use data to create solutions. And we build upon that in the future years where you can specialize either towards electronics and, and the Internet of Things or into cybersecurity, because one of the things that we are seeing more and more with the Internet of Things is that all of our assets, our national assets, like nuclear reactors, like, um, um, you know, um, uh, space uh, agencies, like um, uh, power stations, they're all becoming online and therefore need to be protected. We've already seen how warfare of sorts can come from all sorts of directions. It doesn't have to be conventional weapon-based warfare, right? We are under attack with, by a virus today, um, which uh, some would believe is actually a malicious attack. Um, we are under um, attack all the time online where people are trying to break into our system. So another specialization that you can do is in cybersecurity. And of course, the key specialization that we have here also is in artificial intelligence and machine learning, because we see that as a core technology that's going to help IoT and is going to help cybersecurity and is only going to get more powerful with the advent of quantum computing. So you have probably seen a lot of media attention for artificial intelligence. A few years ago, there was a newspaper article that said Facebook had to shut down robots after they invented their own language. Who doesn't know Elon Musk, right? And Elon Musk calls for ban on killer robots before weapons of terror are unleashed on us. At the same time, we are actually seeing him invest in that very technology of artificial intelligence uh, in projects with Microsoft where he's pouring billions of dollars into the development of this technology. What's going on here? Why is he investing in technology that at the same time he fears? This is uh, the world champion of a strategy game called Go. And he lost a couple of years ago to artificial intelligence. And he said that you know the year previous to that when he was playing uh, the, the AI-based algorithm, he felt that he understood the moves that the AI algorithm was trying to make. But this year, he said that AI's moves were godlike. He had no idea why those moves were being made, but he was beaten comprehensively by artificial intelligence. And so we are seeing a number of cases where humans are now being defeated by the technology that they have created themselves. And what is crazy in some ways is the fact that this artificial intelligence that is beating the champion of Go is self-learning. It's able to learn by itself without being given uh, any rule set that tells you how to play the game. In the early days when uh, you know Gary Kasparov was beaten by AI, probably 20 years ago now or even longer, um, you know, there was a lot of information that was provided to computers to tell them how to play chess. Today, for a much more complex game like Go, uh, we don't need to provide that information. A very interesting um, uh, fictional video that was doing the rounds on YouTube 
uh, a few years ago is about these supposed weapons for slaughter bots. And this video was not made from a malicious perspective of scaring people, but just to highlight some of the downsides that AI can bring for the human race. The idea here was that this person in the middle of my screen is a weapons dealer and is talking very proudly about this new weapon that has been created. The weapon is essentially this little drone that can fit onto the farm of this individual. And the idea here is that this drone can be shown an image of a person, a face of a person. And at very high speeds, this drone can fly through crowds and do face recognition, identify the individual, land on their forehead, and release a small amount of Semtex that drills a hole through the skull and destroys the brain of the person a very accurate weapon that could be used for targeting people that were miscreants. But imagine if it gets into the hands of the wrong people. Imagine the mayhem they could cause, right? We are already suffering with terrorism of all sorts. Imagine if this got into the wrong hands or into the hands of people who should not have access to it or have malicious intent in any case that are using it to control public opinion. These are all problems that AI can produce. And the whole hypothesis here was that it's not one drone, but you could have plane loads of these drones that could be bought for a small amount of money comparative, that could be released and cause all sorts of mayhem to society. Now, when we think about it, this technology is not technology that is that difficult to believe exists, right? We've all seen drones that we fly as toys, right? Or in fact, in, in, uh, in weddings these days, we are often seeing these drones being flown and video footage, uh, very dramatic video footage of weddings being taken by these drones. We also have face recognition on every one of our smartphones. So the fact that we can do face recognition, yes, it's a little inaccurate. You know, my wife's phone can be opened by my child's face. But, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty good, right? I mean, it's not every other person can open your phone with, with their face. So we are not far from having technology that can actually provide this kind of uh, facility to people who need it. At the same time, we are also seeing headlines like Stanford algorithm can diagnose pneumonia better than radiology. Then this, of course, is interesting, right? Because we do know that there is a lack of skilled uh, resources in the world, humans that can do the role of a radiologist. There's a lot of variability in the quality of radiologists. So if we can actually have artificial intelligence developed to an extent that they can actually do the job of the radiologists, well, that's going to be a real benefit to humans. We're also talking about cardiologist level arrhythmia detection with convolutional neural network. And then of course, we are asking questions about, well, will machine learning make doctors obsolete? And this is a big fear that everybody has, and I'm sure a number of you uh, also have this fear, right, of what am I supposed to train in? How am I going to ensure that my skills are going to serve me for the rest of my life? Now, I can tell you I did my degree in mathematics, right? I told you that. It doesn't mean that, of course, I'm using the mathematics that I learned in my undergraduate degree on a daily basis. But what I did learn from mathematics was the ability to think logically through a problem and to be able to solve that problem using all the tools that I have available to myself. And that is the key to education. And this is what we have built our degree programs around, is to say, yes, you need tools, you need to understand how the tools work, but you have to have the problem-solving capability. Because without that, no matter what tools you have, if you stop learning in the future, those tools are going to get obsolete and as are you to society. We are already seeing, uh, you know, robots like this one here called Pepper that are making it onto the retail floor in certain parts of the world. 
There's talk about unmanned vehicles that are being developed by Domino's to bring pizzas to us in the future. And imagine that, right? This unmanned vehicle has an oven. It's baking the pizza while it moves towards us and a perfectly you know, uh, cooked pizza arrives at our door, steaming hot, ready for us to consume, right? Great opportunity. So these are, of course, but a small set of examples of what we can do with artificial intelligence. And actually, you may not know this because you're too young to know it, but until maybe 10 years ago, when we searched on Google, Google was very, very good at retrieving textual documents for us. But when it came to images, it was actually quite poor, right? But over the last 10 to 15 years, technology has come a long way. And now we believe that artificial intelligence is much better placed at being able to identify what is it that this photograph contains, right? So it's a better tagger than human beings themselves. And why is that? Because, well, human beings have curated and created a data set which has painstakingly been labeled by multiple people and been validated to make sure that we have good data that we have given a machine. And computer scientists have developed algorithms that can take that data of image along with the tags and learn a function on its own that given a new image can assign the correct label to it. So we have supervised these artificial intelligence algorithms by creating these data sets that have taught it what an image is all about. And we've taught it other things too. We have taught them how to understand speech. So you now see, you know, again, you may be too young to remember, but half the time when Siri in its early versions was released on uh, the iPhone, it would typically not be able to understand what you were asking, right? And would say, sorry, can you repeat what you're saying? And in some ways, Siri has got left behind compared to Google's equivalent or Amazon's equivalent. But now there are these, uh, you know, uh, speech-based uh, interfaces to technology that are getting integrated into our fridges, into our televisions, right? And we can literally speak to them and they are pretty good. Cortana on our laptops is pretty amazing too, right? So we have made great strides from artificial intelligence. The ability we've given to the machines to be able to understand what we are asking and to do something in response, right? But we have a long way to go before we can have an open dialogue with this technology. So if we chat to a friend, we'll skip from one topic to another, technology is gonna get very lost if we try and do it to them. And so there is a lot of development still to be done. And I think it is time that us as a country can start to contribute to the development, not just by exporting our best brains to Western countries, but by developing solutions for ourselves. If we don't develop solutions for ourselves, who will? If we look at language translation, today Google's translate can translate from English to French or French to German very well, right? But when it comes to Indian languages, it lacks. Why? Because Google is driven as a corporation should be by markets. And if we want the impact of artificial intelligence, say a robotic doctor that can diagnose certain diseases, to be made available to the rural parts of our country, then we have to develop technologies that are based around our own language, right? So India has a great variety of languages. We must support all of those languages in making sure that the impact of artificial intelligence is not just limited to Netflix, 
or Amazon or a few others, right? Uh, Spotify or whatever it might be. Now, at the same time, developing this technology comes great responsibility. So we need to understand the ethical implications of what we are doing. So the example that I'd shown earlier of that very dangerous weapon that learns to fly in random directions as well so that it can't be shot down. We need to develop these technologies with an ethical mindset. We need to be careful about what we are developing. Are we developing a Frankenstein or are we developing technology that is actually going to help the human race? Take the example of a chatbot called my, that was developed by Microsoft called Tay. Tay was trained on a lot of social media data. And the fact is that we live as a race in some level of harmony, but we are a very racist race. Everybody is being racist to each other, right? Everybody is trying to put the other person down. And so when this Microsoft Tay was trained on Twitter data and other social media data, what ended up happening was that very quickly, it started becoming abusive and racist in its conversation. And Microsoft had to pull it down very quickly. So where really are we with artificial intelligence? And why is it that we are suddenly seeing such a huge demand for artificial intelligence and such a huge impact of artificial intelligence that we are seeing today? Where we are with artificial intelligence is that we can make some very nice products We've seen the recommender system of Netflix or Amazon, right? We've just talked about the likes of Google Home or Cortana and so on that have very good voice interfaces, voice interfaces that are coming into cars as well, right? Or televisions, like I said. We have some nice technology coming where we have intelligent refrigerators that can start to, um, you know, reorder things that you typically have in your fridge that are running out without you asking them to do it. But on the whole, AI systems are poor multitaskers. So they are very, very narrow in their remit and work very well in those cases, but they are very, very far from what we call general artificial intelligence. Now, some of you may know this, others may be surprised to hear that Artificial intelligence has actually been around since the 1950s. So it is more than 60 years old as a technology, 65 years old. And in fact, I would say that AI thought was happening even before 1956. But typically, when we talk about artificial intelligence, we talk about this particular conference that took place in uh, Dartmouth where people like John McCarthy and Marvin Minsky, uh, who are seen as fathers of this technology, met and started to create a discipline out of this thought that maybe we can make the computer more intelligent and make it adapt to its environment and be more efficient in what it is trying to achieve. The idea being that we can get it to emulate what we consider as intelligent behavior. So 1956, and we are now in 2021, what has changed in all this time that makes it so impressive a technology today? And what has changed is the fact that we have gone digital. And of course, these graphs are a little old, but I suspect that we have gone crazier now in terms of this exponential growth of data. Especially in this time period where we were all locked in because of Corona, we are actually seeing a, a huge increase in transactions that are happening online. These webinars happening teaching happening, a lot more data is digital. 
And digital data is what is going to fuel this kind of technology. In addition to that, we have now got hardware that can deal with that volume of data. GPUs or TPUs are technologies that initially were being used for graphical processing, but in the recent years, what has been found is that they can be utilized to very efficiently speed up the training of artificial intelligence from large volumes of data. And these two things put together along with the algorithms that have been developed. And believe me, neural networks have been developed since those 1950s as well, right? So it's a, not a new phenomenon, even though a lot of you may have only started hearing of neural networks recently. But the three things coming together of large volumes of data that is digital in nature, hardware that can train complex models, and algorithms that allow the efficient training of these algorithms and these models is what has caused artificial intelligence to actually become a booming area of technology. A few years ago, we talked of big data. Big data has not disappeared. It's just that we don't talk about it as much. It was actually, we, we are now using that big data, right? And producing all of these solutions that you're seeing in the world today. We're using Uber or Ola on a daily basis, right? They're also using AI for intelligently routing and placing their cab, right? Every aspect of life, when we apply for a loan, don't be surprised if it's artificial intelligence that's deciding whether you should get a loan or not, right? Many, many applications of these kinds. And what we talk about when we talk about big data is this idea that there is large volume, a great velocity and a variety of data that is coming our way. So we've talked about volume, right? The exponential growth in data. Why velocity? Well, what's happening now is that machines are now generating a large volume of data because we are living in a world of the internet of things. We have sensors, we have satellites, we have drones, all of these things are collecting data. We have sensors being deployed in agricultural fields. And that data is coming to us at a very high velocity, a speed at which we cannot really store it and say, I'll analyze it later. So the algorithms themselves have to evolve to deal with this high volume and velocity of data. And that has been partly what the focus has been since the 1990s when this technology made its first entry into industry and into our life. Remember 1990, 91 is before Google. Right, so, so it's pretty amazing when you think about something like Google that again uses artificial intelligence to give us access to this information that is being published on a, on a minute by minute, second by second basis of the internet has only been around for 25 years, okay? So what about variety? When I was starting with machine learning back in 1992, data was simple. It looked like this. Data that we use for machine learning either looked like a table where there were individual rows of information and we had this label and we were trying to learn to predict whether somebody was a big spender in this example, right? So there's some input, like I said, and an output. And we are trying to learn a mapping between inputs and outputs, right? The input need not, of course, be data that is structured in this way. And that's what has changed in a major way over the last few years. Alternatively, we looked at this kind of time series data, right? So stock prices, cryptocurrency prices. Can we predict what's going to happen next given the history that we can see here, right? But then in the 1990s, when we came out of the laboratories and started actually applying machine learning, 
to the real world, what we found was data was much more complex in businesses. It was split across multiple tables with relationships. And so in the 1990s, when machine learning came out of the laboratories, it was referred to as data mining. You may or may not have heard of this term, data mining. It was coined by someone called Rakesh Agarwal, uh, who worked for IBM Research Labs. And, you know, what we did in the 1990s was majorly looking at ways of taking data that was complex and representing in this way so that we could apply our algorithms there. And then, of course, there was machine-generated data. The internet happened, lots of textual data, graph data, right? The whole World Wide Web where nodes are documents and they're connected to other documents. Or telephone records can be looked at as a graph. When we hear about the fact that there are many people uh, that take large loans from our public sector banks and then spend it and run away from the country, we bring in forensic accountants to analyze that data. They're looking at transactions where the nodes are companies or people that have been paid by this organization. And they try and figure out where has the money gone. We have satellites. We now have warfare happening that looks like a video game where people in, in a battlefield are wearing helmets that have a screen that is giving them minute by minute information from drones that are flying around, right? There's real time video feeds that are coming in. And of course, all of the speech data that is now digital is another source of data that we can deal with. Now, as a data scientist, what you are doing is you're saying, okay, there is some real world process the process of applying for a loan, the process of consuming content on the internet, the process of manufacturing and refining oil. All of these real world processes are running and because we have been able to deploy different IoT sensors, they are generating data. So this here is our real world process. We don't understand the real world process very well. So it's hidden behind the wall for us. And there is data that is pouring through a pipe and becoming available to us. And as a data scientist here, we are trying now to use this data to convert it into a model of the real world that is represented in our computer. And now that we have a model of the real world, we can actually start to build in some intelligence and start taking, making interventions. Whenever the model starts saying, in three hours from now, your refinery is going to break down and you'll have to repair it, it will give, cause you a loss of $2 billion. It's time to stop it right now and correct whatever is happening before you actually have that breakdown, right? In the same way, we can look at even more complex problems like student learning. If we think of student learning, I as a teacher may be speaking, you as students are listening to me. I have no way of actually measuring actual student learning there. What I am doing is I'm generating data, very boring data like attendance or performance in tests. And we know that this data is not representative of real learning. What we truly want to learn is topic level proficiency. Have you understood each of the little topics in the subject that I am trying to teach you? And if you're proficient in these, then I can build on that and give you a more complex problem to learn. Movie recommendations. How do I put in front of somebody movies that they're going to enjoy? What do I have from people who are consuming my movies? I have ratings. Ratings on the, themselves doesn't tell us very much. What we want to know is, what are the preferences of you? But today, nobody really wants to tell you things directly. They would rather start consuming. And the assumption is that based on my consumption patterns, 
you should automatically be able to learn what my preferences actually are. We look at communities, right? Social media. How does the commun my community evolve? All I can see is connections between people. What I want to understand is what are the communi communities that exist within my social network? What is the likelihood of one person connecting to another one? Facebook is always recommending people to you or Instagram is always recommending people to you. LinkedIn is always recommending people to you. They're using artificial intelligence to even do that. Think about documents. We have so many documents and we want to understand what this document is about, right? If I want to recommend a news story to you, or if I am a business and you're coming to my website, I want to figure out what should I give you and build a recommendation uh, uh, algorithm that can figure out what you would like to consume. All I've got is words in the document. What I want to understand is the semantics behind the words. What do these words mean? Remember words and natural language is very ambiguous. If Shashi Tharoor was giving this talk rather than me, even if he was using my slides, he'd be using a very different vocabulary, right? Now, if we got his recording of the same talk and my recording of the talk, and we tried to analyze that, computers would put up their hands a few years ago and say, hey, these two are completely different, even though we've actually given a talk about the same topic. AI has evolved. And I want to give you an example of how AI has dealt with this situation. So a few years ago, a model called word to vec was created, where every word was, we were able to take a word and associate it with some coordinates right, in some space. The problem that computers used to have when that was not done was the fact that if it had three words like toad, frog, and tiger, it did not know the difference or the distance between toad and frog was much less than that between toad and tiger. To it, it was just a set of characters. What AI researchers were able to do with the word to vec model was to actually plot every word like a number using numbers. And so you know that once you have coordinates for something, you can calculate the distance. So if we look here, we can see France, Hungary, Luxembourg, China are all countries. And so they're much closer to each other than horse, dog, wombat, toad, monkey, frog, and wolf, right? And so now, we are actually able to compare words and say, you know, this word is very similar to this other word. So the idea here is that if Shashi Tharoor gave a talk and I gave a talk, and we look at the words that were used by both of us, now that we can map all those words into a coordinate space like this, we'll be able to figure out that both of us were actually giving a talk on artificial intelligence, right? And very interesting, right? We always talk about the fact that with words, we can't do algebra. We can now. So one of the examples that the researchers used was to say, if we take the coordinates of king, we subtract from that male, the coordinates of the word male, and add in the coordinates of female, what we get are the coordinates of queen, which is pretty impressive, right? So the essentially what we do with artificial intelligence, and of course I am biased, right? Because this is an area that I've been in for almost 30 years now. Artificial intelligence and machine learning folks tend to solve problems that are difficult for other computer scientists to solve, right? And that is the big message that I want to give you. Now, what are the kinds of problems that I have worked on and therefore, as you know, uh, I'm part of BML Mijal University's computer science department, our students get exposed, not just in lectures, but we also have practice schools in year one, two, three, and four, right? So you're actually taking on projects and you are, you're learning practice schools in year one, two, and three. And then in year four, you can actually go and spend uh, time working on a project along with either a company or along with faculty 
and go deeper into developing these uh, skills that you need. So what are the kind of problems we worked on? Uh, we worked on using weather data to predict how much power is going to be generated by a wind farm. This was for a European client. We built platforms for trading, so in financial trading. We have built platforms for cryptocurrency uh, trading in addition to energy trading and other kind of financial uh, uh, products. We've built chatbots. We've even built systems that can improve the quality of education. So, you know, a nirvana for us, and I'm a great believer that if we use technology well, what we have learned over the last year and a half of the pandemic as we've been teaching online, we can achieve something amazing that we can't achieve in a physical space, which is personalized learning for every student. Every student is different. And when we talk about having personalization or recommendation of what entertainment we should have, then why can't students have the same during education? In fact, one of the things that we are working on in the computer science department is to make learning fun, to make it enjoyable so that every student, if you enjoy what you are doing, you're obviously going to excel it, right? And so adaptive learning systems are systems that try and understand from the interaction with the students, what have you understood? What have you not understood? Where do you have misconceptions? Can we give you more content that helps you clear those misconceptions? Worked with retailers, where retailers are looking to optimize what products they put in each of their stores. Recommending fashion items. So some of the recommender systems that we've developed are, are now working for shops like Marks and Spencer's or Topshop and big brand names. How do we build these systems? This is what we want all of you to learn when you come here. Reciprocal recommenders in, in um, uh, the, the job market, right? So whenever there is a job that is to be applied for, we are looking not just at are the skills of the individual going to fit with the job that is being advertised? But we are also looking at, is the job, job, the company that the job is advertised in, is that a good fit with the desires of the individual, right? All using artificial intelligence. So there is very little aspect of our life where artificial intelligence is not affecting us. But of course, that's all about business. And as a friend of mine, Raiz Hani, uh, said many, many years ago when he left Accenture and decided to work for social good. He said that I'm sick and tired of making money for rich people and making rich people richer. And today, the world needs artificial intelligence not just to make businesses more efficient, but to also save our world. It is a core technology for that. You may or may not have heard of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. But if we look at the goals of no poverty, zero hunger, good health, quality education, gender equality, you know, every one of these, life on land, what is happening to our ecology, each one of these can benefit from artificial intelligence. Our world needs us at this point and we need to work with it. Uh, one of my favorite movies, is The Martian. I hope a lot of you have seen it. If you haven't seen it, I would recommend you go and see it. It's about a NASA uh, astronaut that gets left on Mars. And how his training as a botanist and as a problem solver allows him to survive on Mars till the next mission comes to take him home. And he made, makes this, I mean, this is a dialogue from the movie, at some point, everything going to go south from you. You can either accept that or you can get to work. And the sustainability goals of the UN remind us that your generation and what is left of our lives, we need to spend time in helping the world navigate through the problems that we are facing today. And with that in mind, we set up Sabud Foundation and all our students, a number of our students from BMU go and spend time in Sabud Foundation working on problems, 
like agriculture. So here we have built up a whole pipeline that uses data, weather data, mixed in with satellite data, with drones that fly and take images, that use artificial intelligence then to diagnose the disease uh, that exists in the plants or insects that are affecting our plants. And uh, using this pipeline are able to help farmers in diagnosing issues and resolving the, the, the problems that they are facing, right? These are all using artificial intelligence. Using image data like this from satellites to understand forest cover, changes in the forest cover within our country or across the world. How does that impact our lives? How does that impact um, you know, uh, extreme um, uh, you know, weather conditions? How does that impact uh, hazards like earthquakes and, and landslides? We worked with um, you know, road safety, trying to understand how can we, uh, this is again from our drones stitched together, manually annotated uh, information on how can we improve the safety of crossroads. We are working with um, the Kalgidhar Trust, which is an NGO that creates a lot of rural schools in North India, in, in Himachal, uh, Punjab, Haryana, and Rajasthan, I think. Uh, primarily, uh, they went solar. How can we use the solar uh, panels that are installed there to predict how much energy is going to be generated by them so that they can pre-plan for situations where they have extra energy and where they're going to fall short of energy depending on consumption patterns as well. We are working with a professor from Aisar Mohali where we have bought a bunch of these audio moths which are can be left out to record ambient sound in forests in the country that are recording data on a 24 by 7 basis and the idea here is that we are building ai algorithms for identifying which birds are there in the forest at what time as the forest grows older there is a, a, an NGO called EcoSIC that is doing a lot of deforestation work in Punjab. We are actually working with them to look at over the years, does reforestation start to bring back birds that had otherwise abandoned our country? Think of the fact that all of these things are connected to each other. These are complex problems to solve. Birds have an impact on pests. If there are no birds, pests are going to rule. If there are too many pests, the farmers are going to reduce their output or yield as a result. Not just that, there are students working on projects like this one here, where we are looking at creating smart glasses uh, for people that suffer from face blindness. So these are people who can't recognize their own mother in a situation where they don't expect to see her or to see if we can actually translate Indian Sign Language into English so that people with hearing difficulties can actually uh, converse with people who that do not have those difficulties. So I'm going to stop here. There is so much more to talk about, but I would be happy to take any questions. What I wanted to do here was to make you firstly aware of the kinds of applications that AI and machine learning can give you access to. Training as a machine learning engineer or a data scientist, my advice would be don't do it because you know that it is the coolest job out there, right? It has been given that great title of being the sexiest job in the 21st century. That's not the reason to train to be a data scientist. The reason to train to be a data scientist is because it's exciting. You are getting an opportunity to play in the backyard of pretty much any organization. There are social good applications. There are applications that are oriented towards uh, business efficiency. But at the same time, you need to be excited about playing this game. 
And the only way of succeeding as a data scientist is that you enjoy problem solving. In today's world, problem solving has to utilize data because we are getting very, very good with generating data. And if we are generating data and not using it, it's like not using a natural resource. Today, whether it is oil or whether it is data, it's the same thing. They are very, very important aspects of our life, right? So using that data, knowing how to use that data is very, very important. So there's a question from Pulkit Yadav, sir, would AI affect jobs for humans in the future, like labor? Yes, it will. Of course, it will impact jobs. But this is not the first time it has happened, right? If we look at the industrial revolution, there were a lot of manual jobs that were taken over by machines then. The amazing thing about humans is that humans are resilient. And humans will always learn new skills. And so I'm going back to my favorite slide here of Matt Damon in The Martian, right? To remind you that when the going gets tough, the tough, the tough get going, right? And so as humans, if you think there is any job that is safe, forget it. Right? We've just seen radiologists in a few years. We may well be depending on AI to do the work of reading the images. But we will still need doctors to make logical decisions using the percepts that they're getting. Right? So the artificial intelligence, what is happening here? Our machines have sensors, just like humans have sensors. We've got eyes, we've got ears. We've got our tongue, we've got speech, we've got, uh, uh, that's more an actuator, we've got our skin, right? And through all of these sensors, we perceive the world and collect data. We process it in ways, and then our brain makes decisions based on that, using a lot of common sense knowledge. Humans do not have the same bandwidth to consume data as machines do. We do not have the same processing power as machines do, right? So if we put machines and pitch them against humans, machines will definitely win on that side. But today, technology is not where it needs to be, where machines can do the kind of logical inference that we can do from data that is represented in the right way for us. So for a very long time, high skilled jobs are secure. So my only request to you all is that don't underestimate yourself. Make sure that you skill yourselves to be the people who disrupt the world. Be the people that take certain jobs away because your jobs are secure. And then, of course, there will always be opportunities to reskill people and ensure that we still live in a world that is fair, right? So people who are going to be doing brain numbing jobs, you know, jobs like call centers that have been a huge boost to the job market in India. They have a positive side to them and a very negative side. The amount of thinking that a human has to do in those jobs is very limited. The majority of time, questions that are being asked. I read a statistic somewhere that said 80% of jobs, uh, questions uh, asked in a call center are actually repetitive. So if you have a repetitive kind of job where you're being asked the same thing over and over again, it's a job that's destroying your own brain cells. We need to save people from those jobs. We need to skill them in ways. We need to change the education system so that we can actually make thinkers out of everyone, problem solvers out of everyone, right? And so I will not hide away from the fact that yes, AI will take jobs, but it's going to generate a huge number of jobs for your generation. And so skill yourselves in AI, understand it, skill yourselves in the emerging technologies and be the innovators and the disruptors. 
Otherwise, you're like sitting ducks. You're waiting for technology to be developed in the West where they'll come and take your jobs away. Right? That's no fun. Are there any other questions? Okay. Well, in that case, it is four o'clock. So I thank you all for listening to my webinar and I shall stop it here and I hope that this has been useful and interesting to all of you and I uh, if there are any questions by all means uh, you can connect with me on LinkedIn or uh, you know there'll be other conduits to which you can ask those questions and I'll be happy to answer them for you thank you everyone